All right, welcome back. We're now at week 11, the final week of material. Today we're talking about lasers. Uh, next video will be on quantum optics, and that'll be it, because uh, the following week is uh, exam week, where we have the last exam of the course. So we're really gonna zero in on what a laser actually is. I'm holding one in my hand, they're everywhere, and they're kind of a fundamental part of, of optics nowadays. So we better at least make a stab at, uh, at understanding how they work, all right? And, Starting with lasers, the name, it really says it all. Lasers mean light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, okay? And we have to pick apart these terms, and when we do so, it turns out we'll pretty much get how a laser works, okay? So somehow we have a light amplification mechanism by something we may not have heard about, stimulated emission of radiation. So let's dig into these terms. We'll start with stimulated emission, okay? so. So this is very interesting. The first laser is uh, in the 60s. It was actually called a maser, microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And then a few years later, th this was pushed to optical frequencies and became the laser instead of the maser. But what's really interesting about that is that is actually 50 years after it was predicted by none other than Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein wrote a paper in 1916, Zun Quantum Theorie der Strahlung, and part of my German accent, or lack thereof, and in this paper, he outlined three basic processes uh, which will allow for the creation of the laser. Now, true to Einstein form, he didn't care too much about the application. Uh, he just thought that given there's photons and given that there's atoms with discrete levels, this is how they should interact, okay? So we're gonna come back here and talk about uh, the interaction of the electromagnetic field of photons with a two-level atom, an atom which has a ground state at the lowest possible energy. That means the end, the electron is in its lowest possible state. And then it has some excited state up here. And of course, real atoms have many states, but we can zero in on a two-state system to understand basically all the important parts about how a laser works. Okay, so we have a ground state and an excited state. And we'll represent an electron being in one of the other by just a little circle here, okay? So there's one process we all may be familiar with. Okay, that's uh, absorption. We have a photon coming in, and a photon has an energy, which we now know, uh, given by h bar times its angular frequency. There is a difference in these energy levels. That's what these different energy levels means. It means that an electron being in one configuration versus another, well, there's an energy difference between those two uh, configurations. And if this energy level here, delta E, that's equal to h bar omega of the photon, well, we can have absorption, right? We can have absorption. And what happens is that our photon vanishes and our electron gets excited to uh, a higher orbital, right? We have an electro, and this is really the same thing. You can kind of understand it this way. We have a quantized electric field propagating through space, interacts with the atom, and now the electronic configuration of the atom is at higher energy uh, at the expense of that photon being there. So no more photons. Uh, but the electron's in a higher state. We just call that absorption, although technically it would be called stimulated absorption because it's stimulated by an electron. What about when the uh, atom gets up into this excited state? Well, we know that the most stable state is the lowest energy state. This is kind of just a thermodynamic statement. If we consider all the possible energy con uh, configurations of a system, on average, the system's going to want to be in its most stable state, in its lowest energy state. That can happen on its own. We call that spontaneous emission. So spontaneously, the electron is going to fall from this excited state to the ground state, producing the photon. So we get that photon back. It's going to happen at a random time interval. And we don't really know why this is happening, not in 1916 at least. But nowadays, uh, with the next lecture, quantum optics, we can understand this as vacuum fluctuations driving this process. Okay, so we can have an electron falling from its excited state to its ground state randomly uh, due to random fluctuations, and we call that spontaneous emission. That happens with some rate. Einstein called that rate A. Uh, there's one more way. We can expedite this emission process, right? We can drive it. And this is what we're interested in, in terms of lasers. That is stimulated emission, okay? So remember what, what light is. It's this electric field wiggling back and forth. A, a photon can be thought of a quantized version of this, right? So the photon is coming and it's driving the, uh, uh, the, the electron cloud at a particular frequency and that's going to uh, expedite the process of driving it back down to its ground state, emitting a secondary photon. All right, as it does this, this is a key point, so we have one photon in, two photons out, but it also does so in phase, right? Since it's driven by the field of the photon, 
the extra photon that's produced is in phase, it's kind of locked in with that, uh, with that photon that stimulated it. And this is the process that we care about. You can see my animations are getting much more sophisticated from lecture one. Uh, this is the process that we care about for understanding, uh, understanding lasers. So stimulated emission. We have SIRS. We don't have lasers yet. What about light amplification? Okay, so we can understand this as follows. From before, each photon that was in its excited state can be driven to produce two photons and uh, an, an atom in its ground state. We can kind of write this like um, excited plus a photon, we'll call that as a photon, uh, will go to the ground state plus two photons, if you want to write it that way. Okay, so let's consider we have a system like this. We have a photon here, and we have a bunch of atoms that are all in their excited state. As it propagates through the system, we've, that one photon becomes two. Then that two photon system becomes four. And that four photon system becomes eight. Along the way, we're de-exciting these, these, these atoms, right? So let's look at that again. As a photon propagates through the system, we actually have light amplification. In other words, we have gain, all right? Now, one thing to, to note here, I haven't drawn in this little cartoon, is that we can also have atoms in their ground state. What about if another photon, let's look at two processes here. Say we have an atom in its excited state and an atom in its ground state and another atom in its excited state. Let's look in a bit more detail what would happen, right? Well, we have a photon come in. That would produce two photons out. This would kill this photon and excite the atom. And this one would produce uh, two photons again. So what we really need, what we really need is, uh, in the end, more excited uh, state atoms than we have ground state atoms. This is called population inversion. So in order to get a laser to amplify, we need population inversion. If we just had a bunch of atoms in their ground state, well, that's just classic absorption that we all understand. Now, there's a bit of a, a subtlety, so we have to ask how we're going to get population inversion. Okay, here's the problem with population inversion. Remember, we had these two Einstein coefficients? We had these two Einstein coefficients. For stimulated emission, we call it BEG. For uh, population inversion, we call it BGE. These two uh, probabilities are equal. So it's equally likely to stimulate uh, uh, an atom from G to E than it is from E to G. In other words, it's equally likely to absorb than to amplify. So imagine we had, we just tried to put tons and tons and tons of light into this cloud. We have a bunch of different atoms everywhere. And we look at the number of excited atoms. Well, initially at zero, this is say 100% here, this is 50%. 50%, or like 110%, initially at zero, and as we start pumping in the atoms, they're all going to get absorbed to their excited state to try to prepare our population inversion, right? But we can't just keep going to 100%. We'll taper off at just at 50, just under 50, because we also have stimulated emission. Why? Because as we get more and more atoms in their excited state, we get more absorption. So 100% of their excited state, what we'll find is that this will go down, and they'll balance out to something like this. So we can't just simply drive lots of atoms in to prepare them all in their excited state and achieve population inversion. Um, we can add a maximum 50% uh, inverted in, our, in their excited state. So we need to somehow find an alternate route to pump the atoms up into their excited state, and then we can use this. So we need, in other words, another channel to dump atoms from their ground state to their excited state that's not along this lasing uh, transition here. Okay, and that's what we're going to call a pump. And we need both of these things in order to get a laser. So let's take a look at the uh, classic laser that you've all used now in the labs. You've all done your, your labs, helium neon lasers. This is a level scheme for what goes on in a helium neon laser. We have helium and we have neon. So it's effectively what's going on is we have gas discharge, which we have these uh, excitations of the, of the helium atoms up to their higher states. They're going to collide with the neon uh, atoms, and as they do that, they excite the neon atoms up into an excited state. And then we have this cascade of electronic levels down. Notice that there's different channels that this can go through. One of them is, a, is at this famous 632.8 nanometers that you've all written down when you're doing your interferometry and your diffraction experiments in the labs. So, so this is what's going on in a helium uh, neon laser. We have pumping through gas discharge and this collisional excitation, and we have lasing. So, so how do we, we have still a few things to solve here. How do we get one of these lines versus the other? 
Also, the way we've described it, we just get a random photon coming in and that creates a laser in one direction. But when I hold this, it's definitely coming out in a well-defined direction. If you can see that laser there, it's coming out in a, in, a, in a line almost. So we need directionality. We need spatial coherence as well as temporal coherence. So how do we get that? Luckily, we already know how to get that. This is none other than our friend, the Fabry-Perot cavity. Okay, so we, we're gonna place our gain medium inside this cavity, right? Inside this resonator here, we place a gain medium, helium, neon, or some of the many gain me mechanisms we can use. And we put mirrors around it. We surround it by a Fabry-Perot cavity. And then we just pump it through a different route, okay? As we do this, there's one preferred direction, which is not only gonna get gain uh, through a single pass, but through many, many, many passes. And in order for the lasing to really occur, we've kind of swept this under the rug, we've, ne we've neglected losses that might go on, we need the total gains to exceed the total losses. And that's only gonna happen for a very particular angle here when we have this Fabry-Perot effect occurring, right? So we also need an optical resonator to make uh, a gain medium uh, so that we get a directional beam that is coherently emitted, okay? And this is a laser. We have all the pieces now. We need three things. We need, uh, we need a gain medium, we need a pump to make population inversion, and we need a resonator to create directionality. When we have those things, we have ourselves a laser. Okay, and there's a few different types of lasers you can make. Let's look at a few of them. So first of all, we, we have the helium neon laser. Okay, so in this, the gain medium is helium and neon, and we have a pump, which is a gas discharge mechanism, creating this collisional cascade to create the population and emission on the lasing transition. And if we look at these, it's surrounded by a Fabry-Perot cavity. You can't really see it from this picture, but that's what's going on. We have a tube with uh, two parallel mirrors here, and that creates the laser system. There's tons of different lasers we can make, though. For example, the one I hold in my hand is known as a diode laser. And a diode laser is made with a laser diode. A laser diode is like a diode, like an LED or another type of diode, um, but engineered to have gain, okay? So, so for a laser diode, uh, and the majority of laser pointers and and a lot of lab lasers nowadays as well are laser diodes. And the gain medium for this type of laser is actually a PN junction. It's a semiconductor-based laser. Uh, to excite it, to create the population inversion, uh, it's done by a bias voltage, right? After which we have this cascading effect. We've created, there's internal levels, and we've created this uh, population inversion, which can laze, okay? The resonator is actually made just by putting reflective coating on the two facets of this diode, and we have ourselves a coherent resonator, a coherent oscillator. We have population inversion to create gain, we have a gain medium, which is a PN junction, and we have our resonator. Uh, in the lab, you might see more sophisticated, like these big giant lasers. An example of this is the titanium sapphire laser. Here we use a solid state crystal, titanium sapphire, to create the gain me uh, mechanism. And how do we make these things? Well, we pump them with another laser, typically. Well, if we got a laser to start with, why do we need it to build another laser, right? Well, typically this is a lower quality beam at a at very high power, right? That's not particularly controllable, uh, but just has tons of power. And we use that to pump the titanium sapphire crystal, and then we place it in a special resonator, typically a bow tie resonator, um, and tune the output. A benefit of these titanium sapphire crystals is the range of frequencies over which there's gain for a single atom, it would be a very narrow set of frequencies, right? The range for the solid state uh, gain medium is very, very large. So by tuning the resonator just so, you can sweep the frequency over a very, very wide range. So you have high power tunable laser and it comes at a cost. A laser diode like this, you can buy a couple bucks off eBay. Um, titanium sapphire laser, it's gonna be in the six figures. So it's, uh, it's not cheap, uh, but you get a very high quality laser, okay? Okay, so that's the basics. That's basically everything about how a laser works. Now, all these lasers, as I've described them, are called continuous wave lasers. They're always on, okay? And it, it might be beneficial to actually pulse the laser, to create very, very short pulses. A typical titanium sapphire might have one or two watts of energy, but that's distributed consistently over time. You can also get lasers that have that output power that are compressed into nanosecond, picosecond, or even tens of femtosecond pulses. Now, this is very, very, very short pulses, uh, and they happen at a given repetition rate, maybe... 80 kilohertz or something like that. So the energy inside a pulse is enormous, and the average energy is the same as one of these CW uh, two, two watt lasers. So for example, laser cutting and a lot of the hardcore nonlinear optics experiments require very, very, very high intensities, even if that's on for a very short amount of time. So there's a whole class of lasers called pulse lasers. 
Um, there's a few ways of doing this. I'll talk about the main two ways of making pulse lasers and some of the limitations, okay? The two ways that we'll talk about is mode locking and cue switching. So mode locking, if you recall, we have a laser that has a fabric row cavity. And if we also recall, a fabric row cavity has many, many, many modes. So the frequency, so it has a given range of wavelengths over which we can have gain. And inside that Fabry Pro, there's a ton of different modes uh, that can potentially oscillate. Now, if all these modes are just independently doing their own thing and putting out laser light, that's not great. We just call that multi-mode laser. It's kind of incoherent. They're all kind of, it's an incoherent mixture of a bunch of individual lasers. And that also leads, it turns out, to a, a constant uh, uh, output intensity. So if, on the other hand, all of these are completely in phase with one another, all of these modes are locked together, that's mode locking, uh, we actually have a coherent wave whose frequency looks like a comb. Okay, like this, a frequency comb. And the Fourier transform of such a comb is a comb. And the spacing of the comb is one over the spacing and frequency. But what is this? This is just a train of very, very short pulses. So mode locking works by uh, uh, creating a situation, engineering the phase relation between these modes, since they're all, they all have a fixed phase relation between them. And since they're all coherent with one another, this leads to a train of optical pulses in time. And that's mode locking. You can create very short pulses this way. So here's an animation, by the way, of the first 20 modes. I got this directly off Wikipedia. I forgot to write it down. Um, of how a mode lock laser works. Notice that we have all these individual resonator modes. They're all oscillating in phase. And this is just Fourier analysis. This tells us that this creates um, a stream of pulses. Now, we're taking the magnitude squared for intensity, so they'd all be positive. And we'd have typically many, many more modes uh, involved in this process. So we'd have a very well-defined sharp peak of a bunch of tiny, uh, very, very short pulses. Okay, so the other technique is called Q-switching or quality switching. So Q switching works uh, as follows. So remember we had this, this condition that we had to have more gain than loss, right? We can pump tons of energy in, but if there's a loss on one of the mirrors, say, uh, or there's a mirror that flips out a lot of the light from the resonator, uh, we're not gonna be able to emit, we're not gonna be able to laze, so to speak. The way that Q switching works is we dump a bunch of energy in, is we have an element uh, that that ruins the quality factor of the resonator, the Q. And what's going on as it, uh, as it builds up, as we're pumping and pumping and pumping light in, we're building up more and more power into this resonator, but there's also high loss, it can't quite uh, laze. And very quickly, you switch the Q, so you have a high quality resonator. We're in the, within the lasing threshold, we have a bunch of excess energy in there, and then bang, uh, out comes your ultra short pulse, okay? So this is the two ways to make short pulse lasers. Uh, Q switching and mode locking. Now, there's a limit. You know, we've, this is fine for laser eye surgery and everything, but when we're really pushing the frontier of physics, we want even more power. We want a ton of power localized in a very, very short amount of time, a very high optical intensity. So we can explore, for example, the extreme physics of plasmas. We can even make particle accelerators, um, push on electrons or even uh, uh, ions with, uh, with the field of a very, very strong laser a very, very short pulse. Uh, and we just can't do that with these Q-switching. It turns out that Q-switching and mode locking, they limit you to about um, a, a gigawatt per centimeter squared of, of electrical power. And then something bad happens, okay? After we do that, we try to pump up the power more and more, bad things happen. For example, usually light doesn't affect the matter that it's in, but if it gets very, very strong, the electric field of the light itself affects the medium, which affects the field, which affects the medium. Uh, this is the field of nonlinear optics. Uh, one such example is that the index of refraction is going to change such that you have a higher index where there's more light. This is called the Kerr effect that focuses the beam uh, and basically messes up the mode inside a resonator. So that self-focusing and other type of nonlinearities will take over before the power gets high and you'll find the power just tapers off. Even worse, you can get, well, burning. It's not technically burning, but a catastrophic damage because the field is so high that it's like ionizing and damaging your, your gain medium. So there's a limit of about 10 to the 12 watts per centimeter squared. So this is the, the state of the field. Here we, we have, uh, here we have a few different applications. Uh, the, the red and blue down here is 
kind of what you get for what you want for medical uh, physics. Uh, plasma physics, you need a bit higher. Uh, relativistic electrons and even ions need super high. And then there's like crazy stuff, nonlinear QED, photons scattering off photons in the vacuum uh, and things like that. So there's a lot of interesting physics that can happen, but there's a lot, this is a logarithmic scale. There's a long way to go before we get there. And we see that the light laser power is going up pretty, ex pretty much exponentially. This is a logarithmic scale, right? So a line means an exponential growth. And then it tapers off at some point. So we have Q-switching and mode locking. Um, so we needed a solution for this. And that was done in the mid 80s uh, by Moreau and Strickland. So, so let's think about how that works. That's chirp pulse amplification. Basically, there's three components to it. We need to get a, a, ahead of the, we need to get around this damage threshold where the intensity is locally too high. So the trick is we have, we, we, we have our pulse that's as short as we can get it with a relatively high amplitude. And then we're gonna stretch it out over time, all right? We're gonna stretch it out. So the power is the same, the energy is the same in that pulse, but it's stretched out in time uh, so the intensity goes down. And then we're gonna apply more gain, gain it up even more, and then outside of the gain medium, compress it. And that's chirped pulse amplification. So let's go through those three steps. Step one, pulse stretcher. And remember that if we have a very narrow range of, free, of, of times, we have a short pulse to begin with, delta T, that corresponds to a very wide range of frequencies, roughly one over delta T. So that short pulse actually has a ton of frequencies in it. Well, let's put it in a dispersive medium, like a, uh, a diffraction grating, or anything that would separate the different frequencies into different angles, and use that to make the longer frequencies travel a different uh, distance than the shorter frequencies, uh, or vice versa. And therefore, that's gonna stretch out the pulse, okay? So, so the higher, we have a time-dependent frequency, right? Because it's stretched out in time, the higher frequencies and the lower fre uh, frequencies will arrive at different times. And this is called a frequency chirp. We heard about the chirp a little bit in uh, uh, the LIGO talk, but it's basically, it's called a chirp because if you think about what that sounds like, a time-dependent frequency, it's <whistles> that's a chirp, or <whistles> a reverse chirp. I'm sorry for my poor whistling skills, but that's, uh, that's how we create a time uh, chirp. Well, then we just apply standard amplification. It goes through an amplifier, and we go to the limit of what that amplifier can do, okay? So we've chirped it, we amplify it, and then we put it in a compressor, which is just that, uh, that stretcher uh, that works in reverse. So if the higher frequencies got delayed the most, the higher frequencies would get delayed the least. And everything's aligned just perfectly, we can completely invert that process. And then it's converted, right? So the, the key here is that we're not in the gain medium anymore, so now we can have those very high amplifications without burning anything. And that is chirped pulse amplification. We chirp it, create a frequency chirp, amplify it more, compress it, and we have huge uh, gain in power. So let's look at this plot here. So here we have that plot that's continued now. You can see the actual point, the inflection point, where chirped uh, pulse amplification appear on the scene and how the laser powers have been going up. And now we're on the order of incredibly high uh, powered pulses. So we have this aptly named Hercules laser here that can get into the regime of actually accelerating ions, not just electrons, ions to relativistic speeds. We have a little way to go, well, a long way to go, a little way logarithmically to go before we get to nonlinear QED. Uh, but you can see, and it's, you can see it might be tapering off already, but this is a huge technological leap, as you can see just from the, from the history of laser power. And this is why it was deserving of the Nobel Prize in Physics. Okay, so that's it for lasers. Let's summarize. So a laser means light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, and stimulated emission provides the gain, right? And that provides the light amplification. It requires that we have population inversion to actually work, but that's basically, it's all in the, the acronym laser uh, as to how it works. So there's three main components. We need, uh, we need a gain medium, we need a pump to create population inversion, and typically we need a resonator to make a, a well-defined, coherent, uh, direction as well as frequency. Finally, we talked about pulsed lasers and we concentrated on, on two methods of doing it. We talked about the technique of mode locking and Q switching. And that gets us to about a gigawatt per centimeter squared of, uh, of intensity. If we need to go higher, we need a trick. And that was chirp pulse ap amplification where we stretch out the pulse, amplify it even more and compress it again to avoid burning the system or these crazy nonlinear effects which limit the gain. And that's it for lasers. So we'll see you in the final video on quantum optics next time.